sponsored by Ground News. It was the winter of 1777 and 1778. General George Washington, leader of the American Continental Army, was waging a war of independence against the British Empire, and things weren't going great. He recently had lost the Battle of Brandywine, an effort to stop the British from taking Philadelphia. Having failed in that objective, and with the British Army occupying the city, Washington retreated to the nearby Valley Forge, where things continued to not go great. Freezing cold weather, disease, and malnutrition plagued his troops. In the midst of this misery, a local man named Isaac Potts claims to have witnessed a moment of pensive, pious prayer. He was strolling through the woods when he heard the sound of a human voice. Cautiously approaching the spot whence the voice proceeded, what was his surprise to discover Washington, on his knees, engaged in earnest prayer for his country? Potts was a pacifist Quaker and British sympathizer, but he completely changed his mind after the encounter. He thought the sword and the gospel were utterly inconsistent. No man could be a soldier and a Christian at the same time. But George Washington has this day convinced me of my mistake. This story, which first appeared in a biography in 1816, inspired generations of American artists. Henry Bruckner captured the moment in his 1866 painting, The Prayer at Valley Forge, with Washington kneeling in prayer, looking up to the heavens, and Isaac Potts peeking out in the background. Over a hundred years later, the American painter Arnold Freeberg created another version, with Washington bowing his head, kneeling by his horse in the snow. The problem is, this event almost certainly never happened. Sure, Washington probably prayed at least once in the many months he spent camped at Valley Forge, but the story of Potts encountering him in the woods is most likely fabricated. Potts did not live near Valley Forge at the time. Also, according to the story, he ran home and told his wife Sarah about the encounter, but in reality, he didn't marry her until 25 years after the story supposedly took place. Moreover, the story doesn't come from the most trustworthy of sources. Mason Weems, the evangelical bookseller who first records the story, was also the originator of apocryphal stories like Washington refusing to lie about chopping down a cherry tree. Taking this evidence together, most historians regard the story as a legend. Nevertheless, the image of Washington deep in prayer communicates a mythos or a vibe about Washington as a deeply religious man. And for many American Christians, that characterization is a model for others to emulate. For example, in a 1982 radio address to the nation, the President Ronald Reagan appealed to the story as an example of Americans turning to prayer to overcome obstacles. George Washington knelt in prayer at Valley Forge and in the darkest days of our struggle for independence said that the fate of unborn millions will now depend, under God, on the courage and conduct of this army. For others, Washington's piety is used to justify the claim that the U.S. was founded as a Christian nation. But how religious was George Washington? It's a surprisingly difficult question to answer. Even back in Washington's own time, people weren't completely sure whether or not he was a Christian. Thomas Jefferson once wrote in his diary that he heard that Washington never on any occasion said a word to the public, which showed a belief in the Christian religion. Others, like the Reverend Timothy Dwight, then president of Yale College, was convinced of his Christian faith, though he sympathized with those who might doubt because Washington's religiosity was just so tough to figure out. And that might be by design. Washington was very private about his religious life, but there's enough evidence out there that we can piece together a picture. George Washington was born into an Anglican family on February 22nd, 1732, Anglicanism being a denomination of Protestant Christianity that emerged in England during the 16th century, following the English Reformation. After his father died while Washington was still a kid, Washington was raised by his mother, Mary Ball Washington, who was known to be a particularly devout woman. Washington, like other young Anglicans of his time, was thus taught a working knowledge of the Bible, the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, and would have attended church services with his family. This affiliation with the Anglican Church continued to his dying day, though it was relabeled as the Episcopal Church in the U.S. following the American Revolution. As an adult, he attended two different Episcopal churches in Northern Virginia, though only about once a month. More often, he'd stay home to play cards, talk business, or go fox hunting. This might seem surprisingly infrequent, but sporadic church attendance was not out of the ordinary for an Anglican in 18th century Virginia, though later during his presidency, Washington attended church almost weekly. So there's no doubt that Washington was involved in his local Christian community, but what did he believe? 
Some have characterized George Washington as a deist. Deism refers to the idea that some sort of god simply created the world and let it run without intervention. No miracles, no answering prayers, just natural laws governing a universe that runs basically on its own. You may have heard of the watchmaker analogy that a deistic god is like someone winding up an analog watch and then letting its gears tick tick away without touching it ever again. Washington has been called a deist because he was surprisingly cagey about how he talked about the Christian god. According to the historian Dr. John Fia, George Washington only explicitly mentions Jesus once in all of the letters, speeches, and formal documents that are available to historians today. Only once. And even then he mentions Jesus only in regard to the religion of other people, not his own. In his writings, Washington instead talks a lot about what he called higher cause, great ruler of events, all-wise creator, great spirit, and especially his favorite, providence. Now, these might sound like deistic phrases for God, but Washington seems to use these phrases as a synonym for the Christian God. For example, unlike a strict deist, Washington believed in miracles. He earnestly believed that God miraculously spared him in battle. When remembering a close call in a previous battle, when two horses were shot out from under him, he said he survived because of the miraculous care of providence that protected me beyond all human expectation. Other times in his writings, he explicitly expresses belief in the Christian God. In his 1783 circular letter, he encouraged all citizens of the U.S. to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with the charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion. This seems to be an allusion to Jesus and stands out as one of his most explicit statements about the Christian God. And some of the Bible nerds in the audience might have noticed that allusion to Micah 6.8, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Washington was very biblically literate. He read the Bible both publicly and privately and constantly referenced and alluded to the Bible in his writings. So George Washington was a Bible reading, God believing Christian who was involved in his local church. Easy answer to an easy question, right? Well, there are a few factors that complicate this picture. First of all, Washington was reluctant to talk about his own religious identity, particularly when it concerned Jesus. Once the Reverend Samuel Langdon asked Washington to publicly claim himself a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Washington skirted the question. He responded with a vague, courteous reply that only mentioned the great author of the universe. Why he would dodge this question raises other questions about his beliefs. Another question mark is his possibly troubled relationship with communion. Communion, also called the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, is a ritual practiced across all denominations of Christianity. Though the precise theological interpretations and styles of the ritual vary depending on the branch of Christianity, it's arguably the central ritual for all of Christianity. There's some evidence that before the American Revolution, Washington always participated in communion. But after the war, he never did. He'd just leave the service early to avoid it, leaving his wife behind to partake. The Bishop William White once declared, Truth requires me to say that General Washington never received the communion. And when Washington started attending Christ Church in Philadelphia during his presidency, the assistant rector James Abercrombie publicly rebuked Washington for leaving before communion. In response, Washington never again attended that church when communion was being served. He just removed himself from that situation. Now, on one hand, we should note that Abercrombie was making an example of Washington because skipping communion was a common occurrence. Historians estimate that a small minority of Anglicans in the Southern American colonies participated in communion at that time, and the rate may have been even lower in parts of England. And according to the historian Mary Thompson, communion was only offered three or four Sundays a year. So Thompson says that Washington avoiding communion was the norm in 18th century Virginia, while historians such as John Fia say that it does raise questions when we read it in the context of his other behavior, like how he rarely mentioned Jesus in his writings, his dodging Samuel Langdon's challenge to publicly declare his faith in Jesus, and his refusal to return to Christ Church after being publicly called out. Ultimately, historians don't know why he avoided it, and it's particularly confusing why he would stop after the American Revolution. Historians have floated a few theories. Perhaps he was so private that he didn't want to publicly affirm his commitments to Christianity by doing the Eucharist. Maybe he didn't feel worthy enough to partake in the sacrament. Or on the flip side, maybe Washington had serious doubts or conflicted feelings about the most important event in Christian theology, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Ultimately, we just don't know. A final interesting thing to note is Washington's death, which lacked any of the features you'd expect from a devout Episcopalian. 
No minister at his deathbed, and no prayer. Washington's death was so oddly devoid of religion that the Presbyterian pastor Samuel Miller once asked how a true Christian, in the full exercise of his mental faculties, would die without one expression of distinctive belief or Christian hope. Ultimately, much of the speculation stems from the fact that Washington was very private about his religion. He was not inclined to display it to the public. His true private thoughts on the matter might have been contained in his letters to his wife Martha, but she burned them after his death. Now, whatever his personal beliefs were, Washington seemed to view religion as a necessary prereq for a healthy republic. In his famous farewell address, he declared that religion and morality are indispensable supports, which lead to political prosperity. This reflects in part a political philosophy called classical republicanism, which argued that a functioning republic required representatives and citizens to practice virtue first and foremost. And in his view, religion, and specifically Christianity, was the vehicle for promoting that virtue. Which might be why Washington stressed the public role of religion more than he did its role as a private devotional practice. So Washington was a complicated person when it came to religion. He doesn't deserve the label deist, but he wasn't particularly enthusiastic, as some Christian nationalists today may lead you to think. Nevertheless, we can learn something by studying the hagiographical portrayal of him today. These are clear-cut examples of what historians call the usable past. The usable past is a concept that refers to the selective interpretation of history for purposes in the present day, selectively using the past to make sense of the present, provide guidance, or to justify actions, beliefs, or political policies. The concept of the usable past is often credited to the American historian Van Wyck Brooks. In his 1918 essay on creating a usable past, Brooks argued for constructing a version of American history that could serve the present by providing a sense of continuity and inspiration for contemporary writers. He said the past is an inexhaustible storehouse. It yields up now this treasure, now that. Brooks believed that American culture had been held back by being disconnected from its own heritage, and by drawing from the past, a usable past could be created that could foster a stronger sense of national identity, and lay down a foundation for a distinctively American culture. We see something similar going on in this legendary version of Washington, the pious man of prayer who knelt down at Valley Forge. This version of Washington is useful for those who argue that the U.S. was founded as a Christian nation. Historical or not, it provides a precedent to justify a national identity that's uniquely Christian, or justify contemporary policies toward that end. This is what Ronald Reagan was doing in that same radio address from before. After sharing the story of Washington praying at Valley Forge, Reagan quickly pivoted to lamenting the secularizing of public schools. Yet today, we're told that to protect that First Amendment, we must suppress prayer and expel God from our children's classrooms. For Reagan and other politicians, Washington's religiosity is an element of the past that he can use for his contemporary needs, which makes this phrase usable past sound kind of cynical. And it's true that cherry-picking our historical facts can lead to people perpetuating myths or distorting historical facts for political gain. But writing history is a selective process in and of itself. Any university history class will likely require you to read E.H. Carr's 1961 book, What is History?, where he points out it's a mistake to assume that history is just a collection of objective facts. What historians do is interpretation. In other words, history is how the present thinks and writes about the past. And our interpretations of the past are often shaped by our contemporary needs and perspectives, what the historian wants to focus on, and how they write about that topic. This is also the case with journalism. As the saying goes, journalists write the first draft of history. But a challenge that we all face when we read that first draft is social media. The manipulative algorithms in our social media feeds that push sensationalized content and trap us into online echo chambers. That's why I'm excited for today's sponsor, Ground News, a website and app that shows you how breaking news is being covered across the political spectrum. Every day they process nearly 60,000 news articles from over 50,000 different news sources. Articles from different outlets covering the same event are merged into a single story, making it possible to get multiple perspectives in one place. Open Ground News and click on any particular story and we'll show you how that story is being covered by different sources. You can see where these sources fall on a political bias distribution chart, you can compare headlines to see how the same story is being framed by different sources, and you can even see an ownership chart. 
Are these sources funded independently by governments, wealthy private owners, or media conglomerates? In their blind spot feed, you'll even see which news stories are being underreported by one side of the political spectrum, basically giving you a glimpse into a different echo chamber. I personally love their feature called My News Bias. This is a personalized dashboard giving you a snapshot of your media diet. Who are your top sources? What are their biases? What topics are you most interested in? Social media algorithms have so much power over us because they work in the background. We don't realize they're influencing us. But Ground News gives you tools like this to help you be more self-aware of your own media consumption. So if you're looking to break out of the echo chamber and boost your media literacy, go to ground.news slash religion for breakfast to try Ground News for free. Or subscribe to get access to all the features you see here and support a small independent team working to make the news more transparent. Again, that's ground.news slash religion for breakfast.